book retime view again. Did that make any sense? Book review time again. This time, we're going with the Mongols. We're still on the motorcycle clubs. This time, we're going with the Mongols. Billy Queen, William Queen, was an ATF agent in the 90s, and he broke into the Mongols Club. Instead of the Hells Angels, we're going to be taking a trip into the Mongols Club this time. And this story was... I felt like this story... I connected with it a little bit more because Billy was actually in the Mongols for two years. He was riding with these people for two years, so he really got deep in with them. And he... he he developed a bunch of personal relationships. But it's fascinating to me to, to see that a lot of these cops who are going undercover into these motorcycle clubs, it seems like there is a lot of good information that the motorcycle clubs have because there's all almost always guys who know that they're cops and do not let that go until the very end, and then they're the only ones that are standing there like, I told you, told you they were cops, told you they were cops. And that's where William Queen's story kind of really got me, though, because he really started caring about his Mongol guys, even though he would, he, you know, you, you have personal relationships with people, especially spending every single day with them. But the way that he got in was almost the dead giveaway from the get-go. Yeah, so Under and Alone is the book, the true story of the undercover agent who infiltrated America's most violent outlaw motorcycle gang, which was the Mongols. And they were the ones that were competing with the Hells Angels over there in California. I think it was Southern California. And then they finally had an agreement because the Mongols were just too brutal. And then Hells Angels were like, okay, all right, man, all right, man, just chill out, bro, chill out. But William Queen broke into the Mongols, and how exactly did he do that? Well, his introduction into getting in was they had a tweaker chick named Sue, I think it was, who was going to introduce them into the club and try to get them, try to get them hooked up with the right guys. About two or three weeks prior to this, one of the brothers told me there's this tweaker chick in the valley named Sue. And this is Red Dog. Red Dog is one of the Mongols who do not trust Billy whatsoever. And I heard she's supposed to introduce a cop to the club. I said, look, is she going to be a problem? And Red Dog looked at me and he said, if you turn out to be a problem, I'm going to cut your <laughs> throat. <laughs> I just love it. I love it now, especially going through the book. I love it now because Red Dog really never believed this fool. And we get actual interviews in these in some of these clips with the actual guys. So if you do end up checking out these books, you can read the book and then go through and then see the actual guys talking about their experiences on both sides. When he got all scared and the brothers were all up on him, you know, he was... <laughs> He was panicking. I tell him, go ahead and go inside. Well, that's when I met Billy. From that day, from that day on, I thought he was a cop. <laughs> and he wasn't wrong. That's the thing. From that day, dude, from that day on, you already had people on your ass thinking like, oh, I can't trust this guy, can't trust this guy. Where did he come from? Who did he know? Is he somebody's cousin? Is he somebody's family member? No, he's just, what the hell is this? So then Billy hangs out with the club for a little bit longer, and then they're like, hey, man, you got to apply. You got to apply for your, your Mongols patch. So he applies for his Mongols patch, and there's a huge application letter, uh, application sheet that you have to fill out, and it has your high it, it, they want to know where you went to high school they want to know where your jobs are where for the past five years where did you work they hire a private investigator to clarify that your background is actually and they do a background check on you. i mean they are thorough with this and still billy and his team were able to work out a whole bunch of different agents in the atf 
to take on the role of high school teacher, to take on the role of former employer, to take on the role of employer now, because he had his own uh, aeronautics supply delivery company that was his his day to day job, while he was also working with the uh, working for the Mongols and trying to get into the Mongols. Um, so it goes a it goes a little bit longer, and then Billy's working his way in and working his way in, and eventually. He has the patch. He has the the middle patch and the bottom patch. You have to earn that top patch that says Mongols, though. There's there's a three piece patch. That top patch. You, you you you. There's three of them that you have to earn, and you progressively get them. And he was trying to get his last patch, that Mongols, the Mongols patch. And they played a little joke on him. They played a little game, and they were like, "All right, Billy, man." Um, let me let me see your colors real quick. So he took him took off his jacket and handed it to his friend, and this friend was like, "Dude, don't you ever fucking take this off." This is like a, in the uh, previous uh, book review that I did for Jay Dobbins. They killed a Mongol and took his colors, and this is going. This is talking about that you never let anyone have your colors, even even your own brothers. So then they have a big meeting with Billy saying, hey, man, what the fuck? We're, we, we have to take a patch away from you because this is bullshit. You can't let anybody have your colors. And then Billy was like, no, no, fuck that. Fuck that. Don't take my patch. Don't take my patch. And they were like, what's your deal, Billy? What's your deal? What do you want? You want your top patch? And he was like, fuck yeah, I want my top patch. And they're like, okay. And they gave him his top patch. So he got his top patch. He celebrated. They all go crazy. They all go fucking wild because they got a new Mongol now. And he ended up being a really good one. But he was an undercover cop. And he had access to all of their stuff. And then they had a treasury position. And since he was well-equipped to handle the job mentally, they decided to make him put him in charge of the books. They put him in charge of the books. And he had everything there then, everything there then. And it's crazy. With all this being said, he's working his way into the organization. He's gotten himself to the point to where these people trust him. They trust him with the books on the crimes that they're doing. All that crazy information. He has all this acceptance. He's doing everything that he can. He's getting himself in the door. Not only did he get himself in the door, but he's gotten access to all of their information. Everything, all of the different transactions that they have going on throughout different the crime stuff, the paying dues for different clubs in different areas. He has access to all of this stuff. With all that being said, he earned all of this crazy trust. There's one Mongol, one Mongol who knows the deal. One Mongol remains unconvinced. The National Sergeant at Arms, Red Dog. Red Dog, don't play. One evening at a makeshift shooting range, Red Dog decides to force a showdown with Prospect Billy. But see, Red Dog did make the decisions. He was the one that said, no, I don't, but he was vetoed. He, he voted no to not let Billy in the club, and they vetoed him. He lost a little bit of power there. Didn't, didn't have his political strength in order. Because everything's a bureaucracy, guys. Everything, even outlaws. Academy. I jammed him right away. How long were you at the academy, Billy? And he's like, what do you mean? Well, you know what the f I mean. How long were you at the academy? <laughs> How long were you at the academy? I don't know what you're talking about. Who'd you tell you were coming up here, Billy? Who knows that you're with the Mongols today? Red Dog, I didn't tell anybody I was coming mm -hmm. up here. Then he says, so if I put a bullet in the back of your head, you say and nobody's going to know where to start looking for you. <laughs> I like it because Red Dog has to play by the rules uh and and he's not going to be go against the mongol leadership he's not going to go against his brothers but he is making sure that billy knows that he don't like him and i said yeah that's right red dog and he looked at me and he said go out there in the field and start setting up some targets billy <laughs> So I turned my back to all those Mongols started walking out in the field, thinking to myself, well, if they've made you, they're going to kill you. So I set up some cans, 
started to walk back. Here it is. Right before I got there, Red Dog raises his gun up and bam! And I could feel it <laughs> blast go by my face. Man, he was he was trying to let him know. He was trying to let him know. <laughs> Woo. And then they all started shooting. Boom, 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 boom. Red Dog senses Queen's fear. He was scared of me. I knew he was scared of me. But, you know, I wouldn't shoot somebody in front of five people unless I was really had to, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, they are your brothers, the Mongols, but they probably don't want to be part of that shit either. <laughs> probably don't want a piece of that either. Finding out what it takes to be a Mongol. The daily mayhem, drugs and guns. All over, all over, all over. Making it work. But you see, Red Dog knew this whole damn time. He knew this whole damn time. He knew it. He knew it. But now he's, he's, Billy's so deep in, he's so deep into the Mongols, he's getting to the point to where they need to, they need to get him out. Queen's ATF superiors realize he has been undercover too deep, too long. He's in danger of burnout. He looks like a Mongol, though, man. <laughs> he looks Concerned like one of those guys. There, they decide it's time to bring Operation Ivan to a close. Time to end it. Now they're going to crash down hard on everybody. Crash down hard on everybody. And now they start making the arrests all over the place. 300 heavily armed ATF officers. 300 ATF raid officers. locations across Southern California. Raiding... Party. See all these cops with these machine guns, you know, and red dog, full body armor. They're hopping out of these vans, mm. or mm. four van loads of them. So I, I was looking for my gun, and I see it, and uh, I grabbed the pistol, and they're coming up my steps. So they were right there, and I had the gun in my they hand. They got you, red dog, Dan, bro. They got you. They got red dog, them. man. I mean, we wouldn't be doing this interview not, not out here. You know? <laughs> I, I could have shot him, but we wouldn't be doing this interview. Oh, Billy got him. Billy got him. He was using an illegal gun. Members of the San Fernando Valley chapter are also arrested. And they, arrest, they arrested a lot of the guys. They arrested a lot of the guys. They finally got it going. And now, so now he, he went through all of that. He's done everything that he could do to possibly crack down hard on all these guys. And they did, they, they raided them. Boom, right off, right off on the instant. And they started going. And as it was all going on, Billy gets a call from one of the Mongols named Top Hat. And Top Hat was telling him, he was like, hey, man, I, there's this new Mongol that's in here, and I'm sure that he's the guy that did it. He's the one that told everybody about, he was, he's the informant. He's the one. So they were making a plan to go kill him. And Billy had to tell him, like, hey, man, no, man, no, man, look, look. I'm the cop. I'm Special Agent William Queen. You, if you guys go over there and shoot the, if you guys go over there and kill that person, just know it's your ass. And you literally just told me. And they got real quiet and hung up. And you, at the end of the book, you have this feeling that he has hard, hard emotions about this stuff. He has been in, he's been in deep with these guys for so long he's having a hard time separating himself the cop from the outlaw as the person his mother recently died and he's been in North Carolina for her funeral so he has to come back Queen has this no is time to grieve. he returns to work this is one of the more interesting parts about this story is how emotionally he gets ATF really wanted me back in so I got back on the bike I rode over to evil's house when evil came to the door I Poor extended evil. my hand for the Mongol handshake and evil grabbed me put a big bear hug on me and he said Billy I love you and I'm sorry about your mama those are your brothers man those are your brothers. And you know he's got to feel some kind of way. And when Domingo came in... Because he is lying. It's the same thing. 
he when is lying to him. Came in, it was the you same know? thing. We love you, but, brother, and we're sorry about your mama. And they're hugging uh, me, and they're telling me that they love me. So conflicted. And I felt that love, <laughs> and it hurt me. Queen feels more confused Man. than he's ever felt before during his undercover career. Now, the thing is, after that, um, we'll, we'll get off the video now because we're going to end it. We're going to end it right here. Now, after that, he was talking about evil, and evil was the, the house who's, the guy whose house he went to, uh, to visit after his mom died, and he hugged him and said, I love you, brother. I, I'm so sorry about your mother. And all of his brothers did that as well. And a lot of these guys don't have a good time when they get out of their undercover time. Now, he, would, he had the luxury of not having to go to court for Red Dog's arrest because Red Dog pleaded guilty. A lot of the guys pled guilty so they could get out a lot quicker and, and reach some type of a deal. But Evil was there, and he had to show up in court for Evil. And when he showed up to court for Evil, he was so conflicted about it until he actually went out there on the stand and he saw Evil. And he was saying that the look that he got from evil wasn't anything that he was expecting. He was expecting him to mug, be mugging him, him to be giving him these eyeballs like, oh, I'm going to get you, cop. I'm going to get you. But when he looked at evil, all he could see was a hurt man. All he could see was one of his friends for a little while there, at least. Maybe it wasn't his real friend, but evil definitely thought that they were friends. And he felt bad and he felt really bad because he felt like he had betrayed one of his friends and what a what a deep complicated situation to be in as an undercover cop like that because you are building a legitimate real rapport with people and then whenever you get out it's not like the atf takes care of you too well i mean they took care of william a little bit but they have they had to move his family to Florida. They had to move him to Texas. They had to move him all over the place because of this. And it didn't end up being worth it for him at the end. At the end, William said that after it was all said and done, it was worth it for the people of Los Angeles, but it wasn't worth it for him. He said he thinks that people who do take these types of jobs should at least not have a family because and that's that's the that's the same thing with the other undercover cop uh jay bird from the other video from the other book that i reviewed but at the end he said it just it wasn't worth it for him it should be somebody with no family who has who who has a lot less things to worry about because the toll that the undercover work took on his family was just too much now this didn't seem like it took too much of a personal toll uh, as much as it did on Jay, but Jay, I think, had a younger family, and, and 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 it was a little more complicated because he was still married to his wife. I don't think that William was still married to his wife whenever, whenever they were doing, whenever he was doing his undercover work. But he still had children, and that's and that's already complicated. You might get killed on your job. Sorry, guys. Crazy, crazy, crazy story though. I really like this one. I like this one. I'll say it. I like this one better than um, I liked Under Alone uh, better than No Angel. Yeah, I liked I liked Under and Alone better than No Angel. I like that. Um, you know, like like Jay did talk about how he became brothers and friends with all the guys and stuff like that. But it seemed that William really got in there deep. I mean, he spent two years undercover with the Mongols, so he really forged some relationships and really got a lot of. I'm sure that they wanted to keep him hanging on there a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer until eventually they had this giant uh, raid where they they took everybody in and they took them all in. But it was just fascinating for me to see, to do a little bit of research on the book, and then I see like, oh shit, that's actually Red Dog. Wow, that's fucking, they're actually, they're actually interviewing some of these guys and they're still out there going, even though one of them murdered a guy and he only got four years because there was no witnesses willing to come forward. Either way, man, these um, the ATF books were really good. I got one last Hell's Angel slash Motorcycle Club book that I'm going to review, and that is the Hunter S. Thompson Hell's Angels book. That's going to be a completely different, um, different feel than this, though, because this is all about the 
outlaw world and stuff like that. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson is going to be more, um, more I, I think, more of like an overall social view on how different organizations and people and groups view the Hells Angels and motorcycle clubs in general, especially from the 1970s because it's a little bit of a dated book. But anyway, guys, I hope you all get an opportunity to check out Under and Alone. That was a very fun one. Very fascinating to see the uh, lengths that these guys go into trying to stop uh, a lot of the corruption. But again, they are also losing friends that they've made over the years because they got to lock them up too. How? What a complicated, crazy situation that these guys find themselves in. Uh